Welcome. My name is Alexis Flowers, and I'm the Director of Programs here at the Network of Enlightened Women. Today, I am pleased to be joined by our special guest, Lisa Daftari, Editor-in-Chief of The Foreign Desk. She is an award-winning investigative journalist focusing on foreign affairs with experience and expertise in Middle East and counterterrorism. She regularly appears on television and radio with commentary and analysis, providing exclusive reporting on vital developments in the region. Lisa, we are thrilled to have you on for an important conversation about the protests and, and unrest in Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So to get us started, um, could you please share a brief overview for maybe those who haven't been following along as closely? What happened about a month ago and where do things stand today? Sure. So um, actually, I'll take you back 43 years. This regime has been in power for 43 years after a revolution that was supported by the West. Uh, the Shah of Iran was toppled in 1979 and in comes what was supposed to be an interim government, but instead was a stolen revolution by the Islamic Republic of Iran. So imagine a very progressive country in the Middle East under the Shah of Iran in the 70s. You know, Iran was thriving. You know, you have photos of women in their mini skirts and going to college and being multilingual and really having cafes and bars and people just being co-ed and enjoying life. And then all of a sudden, there being a total takeover by an Islamic regime that rules with Sharia law, where women are, are forced to wear compulsory hijab, they have to cover their hair, they cannot dance in public, they cannot hold hands with their boyfriends or girlfriends in public. They In, in the court of law, a woman is half the worth of that of a man. The testimony of, a, of two women is equal to that of one man. Uh, and it goes on and on. Women can't petition for a divorce, and there are many, many stipulations with that. So over the course of the last 43 years, there have been different uh, rounds of protests where the Iranian people have made their disenchantment with this government known. And each time there's been a different catalyst that brings them out onto the streets. So there could be an economic protest. There can be something of a, there was a university protest in 1999. If you recall or following news out of the region in 2009, we had the Green Revolution, which was over a contested uh, election. And more, most recently was a month ago, we had the death of a 22-year-old girl who was taken into custody. She was visiting her brother in Tehran from where she lived, and she was wearing her headscarf back a bit and showing some of her hair, and she was taken into custody. She was beaten so badly that she suffered uh, head bruises and, um, of course, hemorrhaging and slipped into a coma, and she passed away shortly thereafter. These, this round of protests began with that being the catalyst. It became, it became the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And people from all over the country rushed out onto the streets uh, to protest the brutal treatment of this regime, not just on women, but of in its entirety. So the slogans you hear now out onto, on the streets are death to the dictator and, 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 and slogans that uh, have to do with the toppling of this regime, calling for regime change, et cetera. And I will add, while this is called the women's movement, while the women are out on front, while we see a lot of the optics being women burning their hijabs or taking off their hijabs, it's a lot of that, but it's also just really arguing with the, the legitimacy of this current regime in Iran and asking for regime change. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, this started out as a women's movement, but we've seen it grow protests both in Iran and around the world. Um, what does this mean for women moving forward, women in Iran specifically? Yeah, you know, they, they are very, very um, fueled by this movement. And of course, look, they, they are women who did not live under the Shah's regime. These are young women who were born only under this current regime but they hear their parents' stories. They hear their grandparents' stories. They see pictures of their parents when they were younger, when they were going to university, when they were hanging out at bars and clubs all over Iran. And they're saying, we want that. That's what we want. That's what fits our population. And so the women are definitely leading this. They're being courageous. They're taking off their head scars, which is um, obviously punishable by at least detention, if not more, as we saw in the case of Masa Amini. The hashtags that are being used are mostly about Masa Amini and uh, Nika 
Rika Shakarami, which is another woman who was, was killed. You know, these are teenagers, um, many of them who, who've been killed in the last four weeks of protest. But they continue coming out. And that says a lot about this movement, that the courage is still there, even though the crackdowns have been brutal, the crackdowns have been deathly, but the, the courage is still there and they don't want this, this movement to be in vain. If there have been casualties and people rounded up and people who are being beaten, they want their movement to lead them to a better place and a better future, not just for the women of Iran, but the entire country. Yes, I can't imagine how brave those those men and women are being in spite of all of that opposition. Um, Iran, as you mentioned, has a history of protests and revolution. What makes this current protest and protests different? Or noteworthy. Right, right. Great, great question. Because um, as we mentioned, in the last 43 years, there have been many protests. But previously, um, a lot of the protests were um, contained to Tehran or major cities. So in 2009, for example, you saw a lot of those, what we call the cool kids of Tehran. The guys look really handsome. They have gel in their hair. They're wearing designer clothing, the women as well. You know, a lot of makeup. And you know, they look exactly like the, the models of Instagram, right? And um, it was contained to those areas. Now we're seeing protests in the last few years go all throughout the country, rural areas, urban areas, you know, clerical cities that are that are typically more religious, even they're coming out to say enough is enough. So you're truly seeing it all throughout the country. That's one difference. Second difference is that we're seeing it within all age groups and all walks of life, all socioeconomic uh, brackets coming out. Uh, you know, Previous to this, we had a lot of support from the lower socioeconomic brackets for the regime. Now you're, you're truly seeing everyone come out and say, we're all in this together and it is a unity movement. Um, and lastly, I think this is the most violent or brutal or courageous, you know, there's a lot of adjectives we can use, but the people have had enough. And there's always that tipping point or breaking point that we talk about within society of how much people can tolerate uh, the repression and they've had enough and they are truly coming out to say enough is enough. In terms of their activism, they are burning down police headquarters and besiege headquarters and burning police cars and trying to do as much damage as they can. Um, they've even been able to kill some of these regime enforcers that come around uh, to, to make examples out of them and they're not backing down. Imagine as parents that you watch other people's teenagers be killed and shot at point blank just for peacefully protesting, just for being in your car and honking in support of the protests that you're seeing on the side of the road. A young man was shot to death by, by regime forces. Imagine seeing all of this and yet allowing your children to go back out onto the streets the next day. And, uh, you know, this is, again, the most, the, the best chance that we have seen at regime change, at creating a revolution is now. We've never seen anything as, as vividly, uh, you know, um, illustrative of their true disenchantments and what they're willing to go through and the expense and the risk that they're willing to take to get to that freedom. Yes. Um... I know you had briefly mentioned social media. We've talked about social media and the hashtags that are trending globally at this point. Um, it's been an incredibly important piece of Middle Eastern politics um, during the Arab Spring and, and in recent years. How is social media being used in this situation? Um, and what does it say about the Iranian, Iranian regime um, by restricting internet access right. to its um, people? Right. Right, and it's a great question because, um, you know, I'll take, you said the Arab Spring you mentioned, which is a, a great, great example of the use of technology and social media platforms, but I'll take you one year back to 2009, which was the Green Revolution. That was actually dubbed the Twitter Revolution. It was the first time that we saw a modern political movement make use of social media in a way to get their stories told. Obviously, we don't have any reporters on the ground in Tehran, for obvious reasons and security and such and access, right? Uh, but now we have an entire population of citizen journalists who are willing to come out on these social media platforms and trust us and tell us their stories and send us the videos. You know, when I started doing this before 2009, it was maybe 2005 or six, when I tried to get interviews from the ground in Iran, people were very, very, very scared to show their faces, have their voices heard. They would kind of try to either hide all of that or not, not comply with any sort of foreign interviews because they just didn't want their, their identities known because the, the regime 
team would target them. They would not come out on social media or they would use um, you know, fake accounts and such just to have their stories told. But now we're seeing such incredible courage with people wanting their stories told, wanting to make use of social media. And because of that, the people of Iran have always been the Achilles heel of this regime because that's how they came into power through a people's revolution. And more so than just the people being the Achilles heel or the vulnerability of this regime, you see social media being the true vulnerability of this regime and the people's use of it should have their stories told. And that is why they shut down the internet across the country so that Iranians cannot tell their stories. They cannot use it to communicate with one another in, in order to organize and say, you know, we're all meeting at such and such square tonight at 8 p.m. Yeah. They just don't want people organizing. They don't want them communicating. They don't want them uploading their videos or having their stories told, showing pictures, showing videos. And for that reason, they crack down on the internet. But the people, again, being resilient, being, you know, persevering to a point where they use the proxy servers, they work around the internet blockages to come out and tell us their stories. They still are on WhatsApp and Telegram and Instagram trying to tell us their stories. And that's why it's so important for the mainstream media to be listening, to understand what the Iranian people have to go through to get to us in order to communicate with us. And that's exactly why we should be telling their stories and amplifying their voices when they don't have one. I love that. That's a wonderful note to end on. I don't, we could go on and on, but I want to be respectful of time. Um, where can the women in our network find you on social media so that they can follow along and get more updates as the situation evolves? We are covering the Iran story around the clock. You can follow us on social media at the Foreign Desk and at Lisa Daftari, my personal account. We're on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all the good stuff. Also, if you're into foreign affairs and national security, we put out a free daily top 10 email that will be delivered to your inbox five days a week. And you can sign up for that at foreigndesknews.com. On the right-hand corner, we have a place where you can sign up for those emails or just write to me on social media and we can get you signed up and so subscribed for our daily top 10 email as well. Thank you. Those are wonderful resources. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, and thank you to all for tuning into this important conversation. Thank you for having me.